My name is Sanjay Gupta, I'm a cardiologist in York. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to, some of you will be wondering where I am. I'm actually in Kenya, which is where I grew up, which is, um, you know, where I did a lot of my education and which is where my mum is still uh, living. Uh, and uh, the place, the actual room I'm in is, uh, has, a, has an interesting story. You know, my father unfortunately left us three years ago. Prior to this, he had this dream that he was gonna build a little guest house uh, on the coast, on the on the Diani South Coast, which is right next to the beach, really. Uh, so he constructed a building, but um, he unfortunately never got around to realizing his dream. And after he passed away, we had this derelict building, um, you know, that was of no use really because uh, the workmanship was very poor. And my mum, who uh, is 80, uh, single-handedly you know, because I live in the UK, so she single-handedly got it up and running, and now it's a flourishing guest house. So if you ever get a chance <laughs> and you're on the South Coast, please do come and pay her a visit. It would make her day. Uh, it's called Armand Guest House. I will show you a little bit of the guest house after the video, but let's get down to the reason why we're here. Um, today's um, video is on heart health screening. Uh, and. Um, I suppose perhaps the single most important way to tackle a problem is to detect it in its infancy or as early as possible. As heart disease is common and heart attacks in particular can manifest with little or no initial warning to the patient, the idea of undergoing a battery of screening tests when we are healthy to understand what is happening in our bodies to understand the underlying state of the heart is obviously very attractive to the general public who want to actively invest in their medium and long-term health. Now, very clever people with a background in medicine and marketing have realized this and they've decided to capitalize on this and they've started offering heart health screening packages at fairly hefty prices to the general public. Um, such a screening package will often consist of the following. Uh, you will be seen by a nurse or a doctor. They will assess your family history and your risk factors. They will measure your body mass index. They will measure your blood pressure. They will measure your fasting cholesterol values. They'll measure your HbA1c to look for diabetes. They will do an ECG. They will do some blood tests to measure your kidney function. And then after a screen like this is done, the patient is informed which of their numbers is within range as per recommended guidelines and which are out of range. And then the patient is advised on lifestyle changes plus minus medications to make the numbers look better. The obvious assumption is that a bad number implies a bad process and therefore making the number look better implies a reversal of that bad process. But it's very important for us to realize that this is an assumption and may not always be true. And therefore some people end up being made more anxious, being labeled with additional and unnecessary, unnecessary medical diagnosis, and may even be subjected to the indignity of a lifetime of potentially harmful medications. Now the problem for me as a, as a cardiologist who deals with cardiac disease on a daily basis is that I believe these tests that we rely on in these screening packages are very unsophisticated. And the numbers that are measured definitely do not particularly correlate well with the presence or absence of underlying harmful processes. They may be helpful as a means of cheaply screening a huge population, but they're fairly unhelpful for the individual. And I would therefore much rather look for the presence or absence of the harmful process rather than just relying on a number. In an ideal world, we should not just study the heart, because the, but, but instead we should study the whole of the vascular system because the heart is just a part of this network of arteries and capillaries and veins. And it is vascular disease that is the biggest killer rather than purely heart disease in isolation. And therefore any screening package for heart health should actually study vascular health. Now, let me give you some examples of why the current measurements that are done in screening packages aren't very helpful. Let's look at blood pressure. So all screening packages will say, look, you know, we need to measure your blood pressure. 
But those of you who have had their blood pressure measured will appreciate that you rarely ever get the same value twice. If you measure your blood pressure four times in a row, you will get four different blood pressure readings. How then is it possible to compare something which is so labile by nature with a single value which is produced by a bunch of experts sitting in some conference room uh, in Europe or America? And how then is it possible to make a diagnosis on the basis of this number which is constantly fluctuating? Now, when a bodybuilder is lifting, say, 200 kilograms above his head in the Olympics, we see him on TV and you see the eyes and they look like they're going to pop out of his head and you look at all these veins bulging to the point that they look like they're going to burst. His blood pressure, that weightlifter's blood pressure, could easily be over 200, over 100 at the time. This does not mean he has hypertension. We do not see weightlifters suddenly drop down dead on TB due to massive strokes because of this high blood pressure. In fact, we admire them for their strength and good health. So when you go and get your blood pressure measured during a health screen, how do we know whether that elevated reading is simply due to the situation we're in or whether it is truly high for us? The number does not tell us because the number is fickle and will change the next time of asking. Imagine if you were on a weight loss regime and your weighing machine spouted out a different number every time you weighed yourself, surely you would throw the weighing machine in the dustbin because it is useless for its purpose. And this is why I do not believe that hypertension should be defined by a set of numbers because your numbers will change all the time depending on so many different confounders. The only good true definition of high blood pressure is that pressure that is going to do that person or is doing that person whose pressure it is some form of harm. If, and I would always advocate looking for evidence of harm. If you have no evidence of harm, then on what evidence does one say they have high blood pressure? We surely can't rely on the experts. The experts change their mind every year. Moreover, the experts in Europe disagree with the experts in America. And yet we do not see everyone in America living till 100 and everyone in Europe dying of a heart attack or a stroke in their 50s. You know, the, the what is called hypertension, for example, in America is different to what is called hypertension in Europe. So <clears throat> measuring blood pressure in this manner does not really tell us anything. Measuring blood pressure in this manner will only do one thing, and that one thing is that it will raise your blood pressure further. So a better way would be to say, what kind of harm does high blood pressure cause and then look for that. And the answer is that whenever pressure in any container is excessive, then there is risk to the integrity of the container. If you have too much pressure in a balloon, then the balloon will burst. It is therefore far better to look at the most fragile compartments of the vascular system, such as the tiny blood vessels in the eyes, to see if there's any evidence of damage, such as microbleeds, and if there is, then you know that whatever your blood pressure is, it's perhaps too high for you. Another way to study tiny blood vessels is the blood vessels of the kidneys. And you can look for something called microalbumin in the urine. These are, this is a microscopic amount of protein that is released in the urine uh, and is a sign that the kidney vessels are becoming damaged and therefore the kidneys are starting to leak out protein. But it is such a small number that it has to be specifically measured. It's so small that you can't even detect protein when you dipstick the urine. So you have to actually have to measure it. Uh, but when it is present and if it is elevated, then it's a good sign that something is going on with the kidneys. At that point, all other tests may look normal, but this is giving you a clue that something is going on at a microscopic level. Another test that gives us insight is an echocardiogram, which actually allows us to visualize the heart and a heart that has had to work against a higher pressure, high blood pressure, becomes more muscular. And so again, if the heart does not look more muscular, then it is less likely to be working against a higher pressure. Now, the really helpful thing about looking at processes is that you can monitor the effect of interventions on these processes. 
So if you carry extra weight and decide to lose 10 kilograms, it would be far more instructive to see what effect this has on the progression of eye disease or kidney disease or the muscularity of the heart rather than just relying on a number. Okay, a lot of uh, screening packages which will look for HbA1c. They're basically looking for type 2 diabetes, you know. Let's talk about type 2 diabetes. Currently, the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes is measured on, uh, is measured uh, by uh, measuring a blood test called HbA1c. And if the HbA1c is elevated, then the pressure, uh, then the patient is deemed diabetic and all efforts are made to lower the HbA1c as it is believed that if we don't do so, bad things such as eye disease, kidney disease, heart attacks and strokes may happen in the future. And if we do lower the HbA1c aggressively, then those bad things are less likely to happen. It is worth noting, however, that bad things such as diabetic retinopathy, kidney disease can take five, 10 years to develop. And <clears throat> so this is the current way diabetes is managed. You find the HbA1c to be elevated, you make the diagnosis of diabetes, then you do everything to lower the HbA1c. The problem I have with this is that there are studies which have shown that at the time, at the time of first diagnosis of type two diabetes, up to 10 to 15 percent of patients already have diabetic eye disease which suggests that they've had the harmful process going on for several years before the HbA1c went up to the level that the diabetes was diagnosed. This therefore tells us two things. HbA1c elevation is a late sign. Two, how can we feel comfortable that we have controlled the harmful process by lowering the HbA1c when the process had already been happening before the HbA1c was found to be very high. So, you know, why does the retinopathy happen, retinopathy which is taking 10 years to develop, why does it happen in patients who are diagnosed with their diabetes today? Surely it means that this process had been going on all this time without their HbA1c being high. You could argue that maybe no one measured their HbA1c in 10 years, but it is also very possible that the HbA1c wasn't at the cutoff where we've diagnosed diabetes, but the diabetic process had been going on all along. And very interestingly, there are no convincing data at this point in time to suggest that controlling the HbA1c in the manner it is being done is uh, it reduces the risk of heart attacks and strokes anyway. And therefore, I really feel we shouldn't rely on HbA1c when we're doing screening. We should be looking for the marker that precedes the HbA1c. Remember, the aim is to detect things early, not late. You know, it's a little bit like saying, okay, we know that the snake in your garden is poisonous because 10 to 15 uh, out of 100 people die as a result. You know, you want to know before the snake bites you, bites anyone that it's poisonous so <clears throat> so we should be looking for the marker that precedes the hba1c and that is the presence or absence of diabetic retinopathy or perhaps even diabetic nephropathy which can again be measured by measuring urine microalbumin another thing that is measured is cholesterol everyone gets really hung up about cholesterol oh my god your cholesterol's a bit high high cholesterol is cholesterol that is harming you High cholesterol is not a number. High cholesterol is cholesterol that is harming you. Cholesterol gets stuck in blood vessels which are inflamed and have gone through lots of wear and tear, much like fat sticks on a non-stick frying pan in the areas where the non-stick layer has been eroded. If there is no fat seen to be stuck in your arteries, then I don't see why people need to be take, have to be medicated to lower cholesterol. There is a group of patients who have something called familial hypercholesterolemia, where they actually lack a gene to break down the cholesterol. And I'm not referring to those people because those people probably do need medications to lower their cholesterol. Uh, but if your cholesterol is perhaps only mildly elevated, you don't have any evidence of familial hypercholesterolemia, and you can visualize the heart arteries and the carotid arteries, the arteries of the neck, and these do not show any evidence of coronary disease or plaque, then there is no good reason, in my mind, for these patients to be subjected to the indignity of taking medications long term. 
Well, the good news is that we can visualize the carotids using ultrasound and we can visualize the heart arteries using cardiac CT angiography. So to my mind, rather than subjecting a patient to a lifetime of anxiety and medications, it is far better to visualize the arteries. Look for the presence or absence of the disease that you are trying to work out from a number which isn't very good, and then at least you know what you are treating. So in my opinion, a far more sophisticated heart health screening packet should look like this. You would want, number one, a retinal screen to look at the tiny vessels in the eyes, a kidney a microalbumin assessment, so urinary microalbumin to assess the microvasculature of the kidneys, an echocardiogram to assess the heart structure and function, a Doppler ultrasound of the neck to assess the blood vessels going to the brain, so carotid ultrasound, and a cardiac CT scan to assess the coronary arteries. If all these are normal, then to my mind, you can be very reassured that your cardiovascular system is healthy. If these are abnormal, then you can work with lifestyle and maybe perhaps medications and repeat the same test to understand the effect of those interventions on the process. I really don't think it's a good idea to spend your hard-earned money having things like, oh, we'll do a blood pressure and we'll do a cholesterol or we'll do an HbA1c. Far better to do something like this, which may be a little bit more expensive, but at least it gives you some insight into what's going on in the body. So um, I hope you found this useful. I was desperate to do, try and do a video in Kenya whilst I was in, you know, uh, in, in a you know, my father's dream and, and the place my mother built. Uh, so uh, I'll show you around if you like, um, just to see whether you like it. Uh, you know, please feel free to critique. Uh, but uh, once again, thank you so much. So I'm gonna just take you around very quickly uh, and then we can show you what this place looks like. Oops. So this is the room. And then there's a little TV and there's a little fridge. And I know it's not much, but you know, it's, it's ours. It's, it's ours, so it's uh, particularly, um, you know, it means something. So I hope you like it. And we have a little toilets and um, there we go. And then outside, if you go outside, there are all these rooms, you see. So this was all built by my father, but really resurrected by my mother. So all of those are rooms. So I just thought, you know, because everyone's on the channels a little bit like my family now, so I thought I'd tell you where I came from. Excellent. Take care, bye.